Once in a lifetime, you have the possibility of starting an institution, right? Yes, you may do the plumbing, but you do all sorts of other things as well. We could re-question what it was we were doing. If it was going to happen anywhere in a public university, it was the University of California. It was a new deal in higher education, and I wanted to be part of it. Santa Cruz at that time was a somewhat seedy beach town. It was a great place for old people to come wait for the clock to turn. We went downtown to Pacific Avenue and there was a bar up at the upper end, the Manhattan Bar, and it had a big sign that said, where the action is. We need to make a phone call, so I said, Dan, I'll go in and, and use the phone in the, in the bar. I went in and there was nobody there and no bartender, nobody. And I came out and I said to her, I think it'll be a good place to raise children. I came up High Street and I saw this gate with a cattle guard and a little building inside, what's the cookhouse? That was UCSC and uh, it took a while to get my bearings. It was totally different than anything I was used to at any university I'd ever been to be in a cookhouse on a ranch. What struck me when I walked up to the buildings in the Redwoods was turning around and looking at the view. One of the great views on the planet. In a way, I can't imagine this place without that view. It is perspective. I think given 50 years going on that we all need perspective, and that's where I get mine. We had a big problem here at the start because the dorms weren't finished and the students were coming. So we tried a uh, series of trailers here and used the field house for a kitchen, and uh, we were in business and kept the students coming. My parents had come up uh, with, and they said, we don't want to alarm you, but we didn't see any buildings there. You know, it was a big adventure, a big pioneering adventure. I would have paid them to work here. We didn't arrive here to a whole set of buildings, and I think that does matter, because we were having to improvise all the time, and that involved a lot more cooperation across standard lines of age and so on, or staff faculty. In the beginning, it was a family. It really was a family affair and we never call the faculty doctor. We call them by their first name, period. There wasn't the separation between faculty and staff. They were young, we were young, and it was new, and nobody really knew how to do it, so we had to figure it out together. We all got up here, and just the excitement of the first people arriving was infectious, and the whole staff was very excited about this endeavor of opening a new campus. I must have been asked 300,000 questions in my years by students. And what did I answer? I would give them the name of somebody in the staff. Staff often uh, kind of get the short stick, uh, but they were, they, were, they were terrific. We could go off and behave like professors, and, and they did the work. I got to talk to all the prospective students and their parents and they'd arrive at the office in the Han Student Services building and say, where's the university? Because they'd driven through all of these pastures and the cows and seen the field house and cowl and that was it. They were all cleanly dressed, neatly dressed, pressed, khakis, skirts, nothing shaggy, nothing unbuttoned or unzipped. That all happened towards the end of that year. It was an unconventional time. We were all overcome by history and culture. Probably the worst of all years to found a new experimental university, but we did it anyway. The combination of a set of liberal arts students who were searchers and seekers that were open, that were told, go out, learn, when you then throw in the reality of what was going on in the civil rights movement and the anti-war movement and the environmental movement and the feminist movement. It created a culture that was built around intellectual concerns and social issues. The whole issue here was to ask, what should we be learning and teaching? What does it matter? The point of the class was the student not the material. And people would say, how do you know they learned it? You don't, but you know they had an experience. And the sense that we were responsible for these young people stretched us and made us better than 
we would have been. They're not teaching them just to do their ABC so they can go get a particular job. And for faculty, that's a joy, that's a delight. It wasn't the information itself that, that was primary, it was the process of gaining it. The first time I went to a university-wide committee meeting in Berkeley, the chairman said to me, glad to meet you. Uh, what the hell is going on down there? What are you guys doing? Page was an iconoclast, and he wanted people that were not traditional. You know, it was soon apparent that everybody he hired was in some way atypical in their discipline. But yeah, or it was. Uh, uh, the different languages from different buildings. They had nothing to do with each other at all. So to come here and have it all together was really exciting. Everybody that came here had that kind of spirit that brought them to this particular kind of camp. If they weren't like that, you know what? They left. And I know people that left, they couldn't stand Santa Cruz. They couldn't stand that their office was open, that undergraduates were knocking on their door. People say, uh, well, it was an experiment, and did the experiment succeed or fail? And my answer to that is experiments don't succeed or fail, they teach. The greatest joy was landing quality faculty members and staff that would respond to these dreams of Dean McHenry and Clark Kerr. It was a dream. Between Clark Kerr and Dean McHenry, they made it live. It's one of my kids. Um, and I would no more leave this place than abandon my kids. <laughs>